dear ones. You're listening to the What God Is Not podcast with Father Michael O'Loughlin and Mother Natalia. Hello, listeners. This is Father Michael. Today is Mother Natalia's episode. She's going to be talking about the eight evil thoughts. And uh, this is one of two. So the next episode coming out will also be um, the conclusion or maybe episode two of of uh, eight evil thoughts uh, today we talk about the first three so gluttony lust and avarice and talk about how um cashin and uh, vagrius and gregory the great processed these and how they became uh, what most americans know as the seven deadly sins uh, we process them also with great hope of course because that's the end of all of this and also, uh, we find out that uh, one of our friends who drove a cigar bar has cigar lockers and what that may mean for an additional ministry of our beautiful podcast here. So look forward to that. If you are a hashtag banter hater, um, in Mother's Brilliance, we stop bantering at exactly seven minutes from the end of this announcement. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Hi, Father Michael Lachlan. Hello. How are you doing, Mother Natalia of Christ the Bridegroom Monastery? <laughs> Burton, Ohio. Um, uh, technically, Troy Township. Is that your way of not saying my last name? I appreciate that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> I do appreciate you that. You don't have a last name anymore. That's right. Or is it? Is it Christ? Mother Natalia Christ. <laughs> because Christ is Jesus' <laughs> last name? <laughs> yes. Well, a lot of people think that, so I get that. Uh, hey, guess what I did yesterday? Did you you did a yesterday? little bit know because I sent you a text message. You know a very tiny part of it. Oh, I do. You get around. I know. For a monastic. Um, <laughs> join the monastery, see the world, as they say. Uh, no, it was, just a, it was just a day trip. So my mom was in town. My mom has been listening to Cameron Frad's podcast, Among the Lilies, mm, nice. and it's just been really, really helpful for her. So my mom, uh, when she was in town, she was like, um, hey, I think I'm going to drive to Steubenville and just pop in on Cameron and tell her thank you for her podcast. And I was like, hey, mom, how about I reach out to Cameron and ask if we can visit her. And <laughs> and um and Thursday <laughs> and Thursday happened to be my personal day for the month. Um mm. which we get once a month and we still have all the normal prayer services, but every once in a while we can miss noon prayer if we ask permission. So um so my mom and I left after matins, after morning prayer and I took her to Steubenville for the day. And then we um, got back in time for Vespers. So it was just a little day trip. But nice. we um, it was full of adventures. We stopped by a brew shop on the way because I needed to buy some stuff for the brew that I beard. The be- <laughs> I thought you did that on purpose. Like, I did not I, do that on that purpose. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> the beer that I brewed. Um <laughs> And do you know what I realized I messed up an idiom in the oh, podcast shock. we <laughs> the podcast we did with Father Boniface. Um and it was like really embarrassing if I if I'm remembering correctly that I messed it up, which I think I did. Um but we'll see if listeners know. I'm sure someone will point it out. Yeah. Um surely. Uh and so we went to this brew shop to get some stuff for the beer that I brewed. And um, for my, when I give the prayer intention at the end of this podcast, I can tell you um, what the beer was brewed for, Mm -hmm. for what the beer was brewed, Hmm. Um, which you already know, but our listeners don't know. Uh, So we went to the brew shop little stop at Walmart. And then I took her to Chesterton and Company, um, which is the cigar shop that Matt opened. Um, Matt Frad. That's a long name. Do they just call it Chesterton's or something? I don't know. Chesties. That's that's weird. (laughs) Um, They might call it Chesterton's. (laughs) I don't don't know. Uh, Different logo, different restaurant. Um, It was actually really sweet. I hadn't told Matt that I was going to be in town, although he had found out from Cameron. And so okay. I just dropped in because my mom wanted to get some um, pipe t- tobacco for my dad because uh, my dad's 
a big pipe smoker. And so when we got there, the guy at the counter was like, um, oh, Matt's here if you want to say hi. So I went back and I was like, oh, hey. And uh, so that was a fun surprise. And then and then he just gave us tobacco for my dad. Like he oh. gave us a couple different kinds of tobacco. And he's like, it's on me. And it was very sweet. Um, cool. Yeah. And then we went to and I'm I'm blanking on the name of the guy at the counter and I feel really bad because he was so sweet. He gave me oh, at Chesties. Yeah. Stop calling it that. It's weird. <laughs> um <laughs> he gave me uh <laughs> um he gave me a couple cigars from his own stash, which was very sweet. Um so then um we and then we grabbed lunch, coffee and lunch at Leonardo's and then we went over and hung out with Cameron for a couple hours and then came home. Do we? Do they have lockers there, humidify lockers? My, most cigar bars, most cigar lounges have like lockers where guys can, you can rent a locker for the year and then just keep your, you, you can buy boxes of cigars and keep them there. Not that I know of. Okay. If they ever get lockers, Matt, if you're listening, if you get lockers, we're going to get what God is not locker. And we're going <laughs> to we're gonna keep cigars in there and then... When we come, like once a year, <laughs> we, can, we can use the lockers. And other times, our listeners can go and we can give them a special password. And then they can say the password to the guy at the front desk. And, and fill up our get, lockers. Then, <laughs> there we go. And you can put cigars in our locker. <laughs> Just kidding. No, you can get a cigar out of the locker then. That would be kind of cool. So be I think well, you probably would have seen it. We'll ask Matt. I'm... As you know, I'm extremely unobservant, so I might not have seen it. Text? Oh, no. What? What's wrong with my phone? Your phone doesn't want you texting people during our recording. Text Matt Frad, does your new cigar bar have lockers? You forgot the question mark. Question mark. Question mark. mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So anyways, that's what I did yesterday. It was really fun. It was nice that's to nice. have the time with my mom because we don't usually get, I don't even know the last time I had, um, I don't know that I've had that much one-on-one time with her since I entered. I guess sometimes mm-hmm. on home visit, but um, usually where we're not working. like Long drives are nice for that. Yeah. So And Steubenville is only... An hour 45? I don't know. Something like that. So, anyways, it's not bad. Yeah, I'm going to hopefully go see that. Um, I'm going out in November to the area for something, and I'm gonna, I am gonna. may play hooky from the event and go sit and smoke a cigar the whole time anyway. That is not funny. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you know what that sounds like to me, Father Michael? Yes. That sounds like... Sloth. <laughs> uh, you are the queen of transitions. <laughs> Is that a reference to earlier when I said I'm the queen of awkward? <laughs> you literally, like, you waited till we were seven minutes in to the banter, and then you're like, okay, we're at seven. How do I say sloth? So if you see this video of a what sloth happened. closing the road. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking uh, of sloth, <laughs> I can't believe I can't believe you saw all of that happen in my brain. Um, so, uh, but here's the thing: this episode is not just about sloth. Do you do you know what this episode's about, Father Michael? Um, sloth and I'll give you a hint: cigars. No, it's about oh. sloth and gluttony. And pride. This is. You are so Western. <laughs> um, evil thoughts. Yeah, good Yay. job. It's uh, it's about the eight evil thoughts. So I've been saying for a long time that once you did your episode on sin, I would do an episode on the eight evil thoughts. And recently, some listeners have reached out and said, "Yo." When are you going to do that episode? So this is that episode. I'm glad we only bantered for exactly seven minutes so we can get to this topic. (laughs) um, Yeah. This one deserves a full... A full episode. I agree. 50 minutes. So here's my plan. Bruh. 
My plan yes, is Father Brett to you. Yeah. My plan is to give just very quickly the historical context of the eight evil thoughts. Um and then to uh and then to just go through each of them um, from um, what Cashin wrote about them and to share my favorite little tidbits that, that Cashin shares about each of the eight evil thoughts. So um, that's that. So historical context first. S- most of our listeners, most people who are listening to this have surely heard of the seven deadly sins, right? This is like, Super, even if you're not religious, people have heard of the seven deadly sins because they've made horror movies about them and they've like done lots of different whatever. It's just common. You might not know what they are, but you've heard the phrase seven deadly sins. Um, so, but I think a lot of people, unless you've listened to us talk about this before, have not heard of the eight evil thoughts, which is a great sadness to me because. Um, I shouldn't have used the word sadness because that's one of the eight evil thoughts. But it, um, <laughs> it. Or if you've listened to Catholic Tub, you should know uh, the boys, not me, had a special guest on. Um, I think he's dio- is either diocese or Dominican who talked all about these. Um, but I haven't even listened to that podcast. Full oh, disclosure. No. So. No, yours is going to be better. <gasps> Father Michael. Your mother Natalia. Oh, you just sounded like Andrew Wheelie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Father Michael and I had a conversation right before recording about self-hatred. So I feel like now you're just going to spend the next <laughs> two, two episode recordings trying to build me up. That's really sweet. Um, Not only is it true, but your voice is so melodiously beautiful as you say <laughs> okay, true things. Okay, barf. Let's, okay, <laughs> that only works when Andrew Wheatley says it. <laughs> you can't do that. So uh, Evagrius, who I've talked about before, Evagrius the Solitary, Evagrius of Pontus, Evagrius Ponticus. These are all the n- names that he's known by. And he is my man. I really like him a lot. So he was around in the fourth century. And he came up with this concept of what he calls the eight evil thoughts. So these are the different categories of, um, of thoughts, temptations, demons that enter our minds, which we can then act on or not act on. Father Michael has his hand raised. You're still muted, Father Michael. Chesties has lockers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Stop calling it Chesties. It's Chesties so has, weird. has lockers. We should get one. I'll talk to you later on. <laughs> anyway, back to the eight evil thoughts. Back to the eight evil thoughts. <laughs> Speaking of sloth and distraction, distraction isn't one of the eight evil thoughts. But so um, I will briefly list them. Uh, very quickly, the eight evil thoughts as listed by Evagrius are gluttony, lust, avarice, anger, sloth, sadness, vainglory, pride. Now, Cassian, who St. John Cassian, who's a disciple of Evagrius, um, he brings these ideas to the West when he goes to Rome and then has them translated from Greek into Latin. And then Gregory... The Great, um, who uh, was a pope, um, he kind of adjusts the list to um, be more conducive with like Western thought and Western view of sin. So Gregory the, Ga- Gregory the Great removes sloth from the list. He adds envy. And then he takes pride out as saying, he's saying that like pride is not one of the seven deadly sins. Pride is like, the ruler of the seven deadly sins. So it, that's how it goes from the eight evil thoughts to the seven deadly sins. It's like Pascha is to our other feasts. Yeah, the feast of yeah. feasts. Yeah. Um, and the then, um, and then in the 13th century, we have Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas, I did not have these all of this memorized. By the way, I looked this up right before we recorded. Um, in the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas brings sloth back into the list, and he eliminates sadness. Um, and uh, the, so then the catechism, as it is today, the catechism of the Catholic Church, is basically the same as what Aquinas listed as the seven deadly sins, except that they changed the catechism list vainglory. In, or sorry, 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 sorry. The, catechi- the catechism says pride instead of vainglory. So kind of, I guess, a synopsis is like 
Um, pride and vainglory are kind of combined. Mm, sloth and sadness are kind of combined. So that brings the eight down to six. Envy is added in, which brings it up to the seven. Um, and that's kind of where it's at. I have a beef with the catechism on this. I'm going to just put that out there because the catechism says that these seven deadly sins came through the influence of Gregory and Cashin, which is technically true, but incomplete because Cashin got it from Evagrius. And so I just kind of... Yeah, but Evagrius got it from Jesus. Father Michael. <laughs> Sorry. Um, are you, are you going to go through these one at a time? Yeah, that's what I'm doing now. Okay. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, it's because sadness Well, I'm going is, through the eight evil thoughts, not the seven deadly sins. Yeah, of course. But yeah. like sad, so sadness is one of the eight evil thoughts, and that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. If everybody who watched Inside Out yeah. knows that sadness is, is a helpful thing, so we need to define it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I Rock almost made a joke about it. some of the other ones also being helpful things, but I almost <laughs> made a really weird joke. I'm really... <laughs> for once in my life, my... Thought didn't okay, come out of my mouth. Follow your spiritual father's example and and not and talk these things. not have just filters. Say it. Just, yeah, just say it and then and then not edit them out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're gonna not do that. It's worked so well for us so far. <laughs> um, do you want to do a little tap dance thing while I take a sip of my coffee or something? Are you calling my monologues tap dance thing? <laughs> <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> um, when, I, when I had some Roman Catholic seminarian friends when I was in college, and they would call um, practicum, like when they would pra- like you know practice the mass, but they would go through the mass, and they would go, oh, don't rub it in. Um, she's holding up her Pines and Quines mug that I did not receive when I was on. Um, but they would call like the practicum, like the rubrics. So when, you, when you're going through the missile, you're learning how to do the mass, and they call that dance class. Oh. It's like where, where to move, where to go. So that's what I thought of when you called it. Your, my that's cute. Thing. See, you did it. <laughs> um, <laughs> While you were sipping. <laughs> yeah, good job. Okay, so so I'm sharing, um, and actually, honestly, now that I gave my beef with the catechism, maybe this is part of it. I haven't found good resources from Evagrius on the eight evil thoughts. I've only really found what Cashin writes about what he learned from Evagrius. Mm-hmm. So, I think that's what most people, most... So that's probably why the catechism study. says Gregory and Cashin. Mm-hmm. But, right. Um, so I'm sharing... Like Plato and Socrates. Um, I'm sharing from the Philokalia... Philokalia. I still can't decide how I want to say that. Um, I sh- I'm going to ask Father Bonfis how he says it, and that's what I'm going to say. That's what I do with fasting when people are like, Father, what's the true way to fast? I'm like, call Christ the bridegroom. <laughs> <laughs> they know how to fast. So, yeah, the monastery Bonifaz, or the do, person? Do whatever Father Bonifaz says. <laughs> the man. Oh, yeah. No, um, so I appreciate that you keep muting yourself because that is like so distracting to have the yard work in the background or whatever is going on. I was going to ask you, I was like, can you hear Lupe? And I'm like, yes. You can oh, yes. Hear Lupe. So I'm, sorry, I'm trying to mute myself whenever I'm not talking yeah, although it might, yeah, I don't know, whatever. Okay, so the so I'm going through in the Philokalia um, what Cashin says about the eight evil thoughts. And I just have, from reading this ages ago, um, different parts underlined in each of the sections. So I guess I'm just going to pretty much share those underlines and then see if you have thoughts on them, Father Michael. Uh, so interestingly, um, for the first of the evil thoughts, which is gluttony, uh, um, in all the other ones, I think when Cashin writes about them, he writes directly on the <clears throat> the evil thought. So, for instance, the second one is on the demon of unchastity and the desire of the flesh. The third one is on avarice. But for the first one, he starts with the opposite virtue. So he starts with on the on control of the stomach, um, and starts talking about how to fast and and what and how much to eat. Um, and uh, and he just shares what he's learned from, what he's received from the Holy Fathers, probably namely Evagrius. Uh, so here are the things that I, that I have underlined in this section. The first is in referencing the Holy Fathers, um, Cashin says, they have not given us only a single rule for fasting or a single standard and measured for eating, because not everyone has the same strength. Age, 
illness, or delicacy of body create differences. And I think it's just so great to to see this even in the fourth century, uh, because this is a question we get all the time from people, right? Um, even like amongst the nuns, there are nuns who have certain health problems and like can't fast from certain things during fasting periods. And and we often will get the question of like, well, I can't fast from that. Does that mean that, um, like, what am I supposed to do? Or does that mean that I'm um, not going to be able to grow in the spiritual life or, or whatever it is? And so uh, this has has kind of always been a thing in the East where where formation and spiritual growth is very, very individualized. I'm not saying that's not the case in the West. I'm just saying I don't know the Western teachings, and so I'm not speaking to them. I'm speaking specifically to the East. Um, and uh, and it's, it's part of the significance of having a spiritual director, right, or a spiritual father um, to help you to see um, your particular needs in fasting and to, to make sure that they're like, ideally your spiritual director knows your heart and, and they're going to be helping you to discern, um, are you actually unable to do this or are you like using physical, um, maladies as, as an excuse and, and kind of trying to help you find that line because we're, we're so good at self-deception that we need someone else to to kind of help us look into that. What's a, I just want to think of a couple examples. Um, so obviously like people that, one of the things is like Walter Chizik struggled with um, when he, when he, I was talking to a friend about this the other day, when, when Walter Chizik in the beginning of his kind of immersion into the East he wanted to to fast. He wanted to fast in extreme ways, but he realized after doing this that a lot of it was just he wanted to test himself. It mm-hmm. had had it less to do about God and spirituality than he than he would have liked. And he realized it was all just like I'm going to push myself to the limit. I'm going to push myself to the limit and as as a shine of of human greatness mm-hmm. um, rather than anything spiritual. So like those are the type of things that a spiritual director or if if someone has an eating disorder and they use they use the fast as an excuse to continue to live in the eating disorder and say, well, this is you know I'm, I'm th- this is. I, I'm making a spiritual excuse to keep up a, a, a physical um, unhealth. Um, so there, there's various ways that that it's. Anyway, we need we need to do another, another episode on the Jesus prayer because I've been learning a lot of things that are kind of even contradictory to my previous understanding of of the use mm-hmm. of the Jesus prayer in Hezekiah. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, but yeah. So so there there are ways that that we our humanity and the work of the devil through our humanity can get in the way of all of these evil thoughts or all of the, the opposite virtues. Um, is there, is there, is there an Eastern way of saying the opposite or is it just virtue? What did you say? Um, for the? I might've said virtue. I, I think I probably said virtue, but he just says, yeah, I don't know. He I says, don't know. I we, shall we can speak. Say vice. We know what, they, we know what it means. Yeah. Um, that's fine. But go ahead. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that it's, it's a point to make too, that, um, which Cashin makes that gluttony is not just about um, like overeating. And uh, he he makes the point, he says, it is not only, because he's, he's talking about alcohol at one point, and he says, it's not only too much wine that besots our mind. Too much water or too much of anything makes it drowsy and stupefied. Um, and... Uh, that, so, so one of the things that he says, which I think is, is really helpful. Um, I've tried to practice this myself at times and it's very, very difficult. He says a clear rule for self-control handed by down by the fathers is this stop eating while still hungry and do not continue until you are satisfied. Um, and so he, he makes the point of like, like that's just a lot harder to do. It's it's a lot harder to stop eating while you're still hungry than to just not eat at all. Um, it's it's easier sometimes to just abstain for long periods of time than to to not satiate. You know. Um, and I think that 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 has to come through practice. Mm-hmm. It's almost like taking a cold shower, right? Where you just you, you the the more get you, you get in the habit of most people when they say a cold shower, I think me they start hot and then they by the end it's cold and they just keep up being get colder, colder, colder. So the the um, not everybody, but some people do that where they, they it's cold at the end. That's actually like a physical health thing more than a spiritual practice. I think the greater spiritual practice is to get to the point where you're making it cold at the beginning 
and then you're 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 using the shower for what it's meant to be, namely cleaning your body. You're you're not using it for a break or you know a spa day or whatever. What what do they call it? A man spa when you have a beer in the fr- in the shower. Um, what's um, there was something else I was going to say too. Not about shower beer. <laughs> not about shower beer. Um, anyway, I'll think of it. Okay. Uh, so um, he does make the point, though, that, and and I think this is true of all of the, it's it's something to keep in mind. And it's the matter of, it, it kind of goes to what you were saying about Father Walter Chiswick, of it's, it's not just about testing our own limits and things like that. He says, because Cashin says, by itself, abstinence from food does not contribute to perfect purity of soul unless the other virtues are active as well. He does say virtue. Um, at least in this English translation, yes. Um, you the other thing the I was going to say was yeah. it's part of our culture and part of many <clears throat> cultures to, to not waste food and to finish everything on your plate. So the, therefore, the, there, there is a wisdom here. I, I have moved in the direction of saying, I, of course we don't want to waste food. And we need to work towards that not happening. Of course, we, we should ideally finish everything on our plate, especially if it's going to offend the person who made it. Um, but I do think there's ways of, again, over time, just like the shower thing, there, there's ways of, of taking less food, asking for less food, getting different kinds of foods, um, explaining to a parent or a grandparent or something like this what that may mean so that, that we're only acquiring the food we're going to eat, but we know ourselves to know that this is going to be, there's still going to be a little bit left over, but... I'm of the opinion now, especially since I guess since I live alone and since I buy all my own food, but I don't, I, if I'm trying to grow in virtue, I'll eat three quarters of a burger and throw the rest away without any shame at all, without mm-hmm. any guilt. I like that. This is actually the virtuous thing I'm doing. I'm um, even though I'm technically throwing away food, you know, a quarter of a hamburger or something like that, that, that I wouldn't want to give to anybody. Nobody would want that. You know, if it's something else, of course, I'll give it away. But um, I, I, I think there, we, we need to, we need to find wisdom in that. And this is different for each person. We need to find wisdom in, in that balance between this virtue of, of spiritual growth through mm-hmm. does, uh, being, being just hungry enough to, am I hungry for Christ too? You know, am I, am I using this as a catalyst for deeper prayer and, and, and honing my own passions and needs um, and, and, the kind of American or Western European culture of of insisting upon finishing everything on your plate. And there's there's something about um, you know, Cashin makes the point. He says someone who fasts for too long, they say, often ends up by eating too much food. Um, and I've I've definitely found this to be. A, a great temptation for me. Um, and it happens often on Pascha. Like over the years, as I've had practice with the great fast and Pascha, um, I've definitely grown in this and I'm, I'm much more temperate on Pascha and throughout Bright Week than I used to be. But uh, we can often fall into this thing where it's like we're fasting so hard and we're not eating anything. And so then when we do get food, it's like we just completely binge. Um, is binge the right word? I think that's the right word. Um, and, um, and, and cash and makes, and then at the end he says, no one whose stomach is full can fight mentally against the demon of unchastity, which is the next one that we're going to talk about. But the thing that I wanted to say about that is just like this, this overeating and this gluttony, we need to be cautious of it at all times. Like even during feasting, right? Because we can just be like, um, it's, 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 we don't say this, but we often have the mentality of like, well, there's no such thing as gluttony because it's the Feast of Nativity or there's no such thing as gluttony on Pascha. And like, that's just not true. We saw this, one of the other nuns and I, I might've mentioned this on the podcast before, but one of the other nuns and I were mentioning, we're talking about this during Bright Week this year because we both independently were having this experience of just like, it's Bright Week and I'm just getting so frustrated with my sisters and I'm like struggling with this and I'm struggling with that and um, I'm fighting anger and I'm so impatient and whatever. Um, and the two of us, like we're independently struggling with this. And then I asked her, like we were sitting down and I was like, look, I don't know what's going on with me, but I'm having all of this rage. And she's like, me too. And I just realized this morning, I think it's actually because we're eating all of the rich foods again. Like there's actually something about, um, like, and, and again, like we've done episodes on this before, 
we are also supposed to feast, but but I think we we really really need to learn um, to not use feasts as an excuse for gluttony, because then that's just going to spiral into all of the other um, evil thoughts. And people listening may be saying, you know, oh my gosh, this is like you guys are living such holy lives where you think about these things. Like in real life, I'm I'm doing much worse things. I, I am, but I, I think this is exactly it. No matter where we are in our spiritual life, in our moral life, in our, in our life of virtue, whatever we're doing, it, there is a certain sense of, um, when, when I was on Catholic stuff, we did a podcast on gluttony. We called it the gateway vice. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, this is, this leads to other ones. And there is something to say for a certain, uh, I mean, we've talked about this before, but, you know, men going into war, would would fast before mm-hmm. the war because it, it it honed them it made them more alert more aware of, of the details more you know aware of, of and, and able to I don't know what word I'm looking for able to you know just keep alert you know because gluttony it slows us down so yeah, they wouldn't it, it have keeps sex they wouldn't eat yeah mm-hmm. exactly all these things that that are are things of rest <clears throat> feasting was in a time for a time of peace sleeping with your wife was it during a time of peace these things were things of rest beautiful things of rest good things of rest but but when you when you're in a battle which is what lent is what all of life is monastic life etc right we, we we need to make sure that that we we do feast we rest in ways that are conducive to the spiritual growth. And yes, of course, rest. But there's also times when we say like this, I think that's a great example. I think the great realization that you that you ladies had, um, you know, when do, if I'm gonna call my mom and I really struggle with conversations with my mom and I, I'm probably gonna get angry, fast, fast before you call your mom. You know, if you're gonna be doing something with a coworker um, or just someone that 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 you struggle with fast, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, it, it may it may hone your skills so you're, you're not again fast to a certain extent because sometimes fasting makes us angry too. <laughs> we get hangry, you know. But 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 when we find that balance of what do you say, clear minded, whatever that is, that there there's a there's a, a a point there where we can say, oh, there it is, there mm-hmm. it is. I'm in the zone. And I think I I like I just want to point this out because I probably should have at the beginning, but. Part of the reason I like that these are called the the evil thoughts and we're talking about we're talking about the demon of gluttony and the demon of unchastity and things like that and and part of the reason I like that is because I know it sounds like we're getting very nitpicky um because we are but the fathers are very emphatic that we need to address these things before they're even sin like address them while they're at the level of thought um be, there, there was, there was just much less like, and and maybe this is part of what changed when it was brought west. I'm not sure, but but the Eastern mindset, like there's there's much less of this diagnosis of culpability, right? Um, and um, like even Cashin when he when he gets into to lust, um, I'll get to that in a minute, but um. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but when he says lust, um, like he's talking about how like even if even if a thought or a production of images is not a sin, so he does acknowledge like we're not just saying that as soon as these things happen in your mind, it's necessarily sin. I'm not talking about culpability, but it's like to the Eastern Fathers, the the culpability didn't even make like that wasn't even the point. It's like as soon as you see this happening cut it off before it progresses. And they they talk about, you know, the that um psalm verse that was taken out of the Roman lectionary because it's was so misunderstood or whatever, but the about the dashing infants against a rock. Um <laughs> the the fathers read that verse as um as being the the demons and the sins and like as soon as these things are even little baby thoughts, um, just in their stage of infancy, like that's when we need to destroy them. The the Eastern fathers also say that, that those initial thoughts that come into our minds, those are of the devil. Like those are the devil's thoughts. They Mm -hmm. put them there. So we, we, there's so often I'll hear in confession, someone will be so ashamed. This popped into my mind. Like, Like I must be a horrible person underneath all of this because who thinks this way you know who like who has those thoughts it's like well the 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 devil does you know that wasn't your thought 
the the now if you latch on to it if you're fascinated by it we've talked about this too but but the, the, like sometimes we go well that was the devil and just like try to leave it there let it brush wash off our back don't entertain it don't think about it don't overthink it don't feel guilty about it don't feel shame say well that was not of me that, that I would not think that way the devil would and so we we let it just let it keep on going if we if possible sometimes easier said than done but yeah that's that's uh a, a good thing to understand and not let him not let him do that yeah um okay so second um um second uh evil thought is on the demon of unchastity and the desire of flesh namely lust right um so uh this this kind of one of the things that Cashin says here ties very well into what we were just talking about. Um, he says, we must not therefore expend all our effort in bodily fasting. We must also give attention to our thoughts and to spiritual meditation since otherwise we will not be able to advance to the heights of true purity and chastity. As our Lord has said, we should cleanse first the inside of the cup and plate so that their outside may also be clean. So, so his point here is that like, we need to be addressing the the thoughts and things as soon as they come into our mind and um and working to purify that and not only just focusing on the bodily fasting um because we are body mind and soul right like we need to be addressing all of the things we need to be working on on the prayer and um purifying the thoughts as well and by the way this is this is a little moment of spiritual direction um, for me or it, for the world? For the world okay. and for me. I'm top preaching myself here, of course. Um, we talk about those those thoughts. The first thoughts that come to our head, sometimes they're of us, sometimes they're of the devil. But you know the easiest way for the devil to put thoughts in our mind is through scrolling through social media. Like you can read something. I, I remember preaching about this because I had this realization. I want to spend the last hour of my waking day without any influence of something that I don't have full control over. So mm. the last hour of our day before laying down for bed, um, when the devil attacks more, when our body gets tired, therefore our spirit gets tired, that last hour of the day, I don't care if you play solitaire, you can play Angry Birds, you can play games if that helps you rest, you can read a book, in a sense, if you know the book, if you can trust the book. If you can trust the games, trust these things, but but do not scroll through social media because the, the, the devil can use an image or a uh, a sentence or a word or something to put these thoughts into our mind that then then began to whole began a whole nother process. I mean, I know people I mean lust and and anger and all these things like you know we we sit down and we 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 read a thread on Twitter that just leads us to thoughts of self condemnation or we see an image that leads us to lust. Like there's there's just so much. Like why would why do we open ourselves up to this? the impact of the devil and the world on our, when, when we are trying to settle down, it's only going to mm-hmm. get us amped up. It's not going to help us to settle down. So yeah, I, th- I think it's so the devil puts these thoughts in our mind, but it's the easiest way for him to do that is through some, one of the engagement of the five senses. If we can be in control of what we're taking in and our noose, um, you know, a certain watchfulness we have, especially in that last hour. Or so before we go to bed, then that's, it, it's, 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 that's a basic Christian piety. You know, we, we shouldn't doubt that. Yeah, that's that's actually kind of um, what Cashin was saying in uh, the thing that I referred to just a, a minute ago about, um, like, even if something's not a sin. Uh, because he says, um, he's talking about self-restraint and how he says, no virtue makes flesh-bound man uh so like a spiritual angel as does self-restraint for it enables those still living on earth to become, as the apostle says, citizens of heaven. This is from Philippians. And then he says, a sign that we have acquired this virtue perfectly is that our soul ignores those images, which the defiled fantasy produces during sleep. And then he says, for even if the production of such images is not a sin, nevertheless, it is a sign that the soul is ill 
and has not been freed from passion. And so I think this is so, so, so important because this is a question that arises, I think, in the minds of Catholics all the time, right? Like I had this dream and the dream, like it, the, it was a very lustful dream. And so is that a sin? Um, and Cash in here is saying like, that's not even the point. Um, he's He's saying that even if it's not a sin, it's an indication that um, we're not freed from certain um, certain passions. And like, that's what you're saying, Father Michael, of like, don't look at these things right before you go to bed. Don't scroll through social media because it might be like, it's an opportunity for the devil to put things into your mind that you're then going to dream about. And even if the dream itself isn't a sin, then you're going to wake up. You're going to be fighting these things. It's going to be on your mind throughout the day. It's going to be like, it's just so much more of a battle. Um, But I also like what he says here because he says, nevertheless, it is a sign that the soul is ill and has not been freed from passion. So I think that um, knowing the context of the Eastern view of confession. If you listen to our our episode on involuntary sin, like knowing all of that, I think it's helpful to take these dreams to confession, not because you're saying that I sinned just by having this dream, but because you're saying there's illness that I need healed. I need the divine physician to heal it. He does that through the mystery of of repentance because that's um, one of the mysteries of healing. (laughs) Um, and yeah, to, to try to like, just use that as an opportunity for, for, um, the grace from confession to help free us from these passions. And the same thing is true even for, even for memories of when we've been hurt, mm-hmm. when someone else has hurt us. Now, again, please be careful taking things like that to confession. That That's such a, such a, um, the devil is is there in the details for sure. But, the, but there's something, if, if you, if you are able to not feel shame and you you have dreams that are memories of bad things. Sometimes that's our body processing it in our sleep, and that could be a really good thing. Ha- having having dreams rather than acting them out in 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 the world can be a good thing. Our body is actually taking care of these bad memories, um, but it it can show that we're we're not over it yet. Maybe we think we were, you know, just consider like an ex. You know, oh, I thought I was over this person, but I, dream, I, I had a dream about them. Well, that's, you know, thank God it's, it's only every once in a while. But when we have these things, it, it just shows that there is some, there is a certain unhealth in us, um, whether it's our own fault or, or somebody else's or just the way the world is, you know, and, and, and processing through that unhealth dreams can do that. But then also we can, we can take that to confession, to prayer, to if your own Catholic adoration, you know, take, take it to these, these things where you, you can process with the divine physician. Mm-hmm. Um, I just noticed in the Philokalia that I, I had forgotten that it was in this part, but he actually references that Psalm about the children of Babylon being dashed against the rock. Uh, he says, while the children of Babylon, by which I mean our wicked thoughts, are still young, we should dash them to the ground and crush them against the rock, which is Christ. Um, and, be, and he says, uh, he makes this point, which I think is exactly what we're saying here of just... Um, like we want to do the things um, to combat these while they're still at early stages, um, even for the sake of just like future growth and and easier growth. Because he says, if these thoughts grow stronger because we assent to them, so as in like, because we're not working on them right away, if these thoughts grow stronger because we assent to them, we will not be able to overcome them without much pain and labor. So it's it's not even a matter of just like, <laughs> I think this is why you you really, really have to have, it's like a whole paradigm shift um, of realizing it's not just about like, how culpable am I at this stage or that like, it's, it's just so much bigger picture. Um, you know, Cashin is saying that like, we want to get them at the very beginning <laughs> um, simply because it's going to be so much harder to overcome them later. Um, so, yeah. Um, he also says, um, which I think I've talked about this on a different um, episode, but he says the fathers also say that we cannot fully acquire the virtue of purity. So the virtue of purity is the opposite of the evil thought of, uh, lust, unless we have first acquired real humility of heart. Um, so I think that's really, I think that's really interesting because it's like, um, we, we have to 
see the truth of um, our own weakness and our smallness um, in comparison to God in order to fully acquire the virtue of purity. What is the third evil thought? Avarice. Okay. I was wondering if somehow, well, yeah, I get you could tie in humility. I was like, maybe, maybe Cashin is the master of transitions. Maybe, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I've given mother that title, but I, I wonder if Cashin was had that title first. Like there, there, there's a that that he he kind of shows that there's a process here and kind of bleeds into one into the other. You know, like almost fade out, fade in, but it's 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 a most smooth transition, like a good DJ. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay, so. Now he's uh, the third evil thought. I want to do, do you think we can do one more before we close, Father Michael? We're going to do, I think we just need to do an, a second episode on this. Um, yep. I think we can do one or, or two if you squeeze them in, but yeah, one, one is fine. Okay. Let's do one. Um, so let's do at least one more. Uh, so the next evil thought is avarice. Um, so avarice is greed, but it's not even just like, it's not it's not necessarily greed only like for the sake of um acquiring more and more money um but it's even just like the concept of possessiveness. So um for instance you would think that avarice is not something that's very um a very big struggle for monks because we don't um have money. We don't have like our personal belongings or whatever. Uh but these things are very significant struggles for monks. And by that, I mean monks and nuns. I'm just um, monastics, I should say, um, as well, because we can be very possessive over like, um, so-and-so didn't return the scissors to my desk. So-and-so didn't return the pen that I let them borrow. And it's like, that's its own kind of avarice. It's this this possessiveness. Um, and... Uh, yeah, and it's it's tricky because avarice is something that like, it's a difficult thought to fight against because in the world, it almost makes sense. Like if you're living as a lay person and you're providing for your family, it it almost makes sense to just like want more and more in order to save up to provide for your family. Um, and whereas it's, it's an, it's an evil thought that like for monastics, it's just immediately clear how ludicrous it is um, for us to want to to own anything of our own. So I think that the um, it's a more of a subtle thing for monastics, but it's something that really needs looked at for people in the world because it's very easy. This is one of the ones that it's super easy to be self deceptive with um, to tell yourself that it's okay to have this because you're building up to provide for your family and so on and so forth. So, um, um, what does Cashin say about avarice? All right. So in one part, he lists three forms of avarice. Um, and he's, he, he calls it, uh, again, a sickness because that's how we always talk in the East about sin and about evil thoughts. He says, there are three forms of this sickness, all of which are equally condemned by the Holy Scriptures and the teaching of the fathers. The first induces those who were poor to acquire and save the goods they lacked in the world. We see this all the time, right? Like um, the, um, and he's, I should have given this context at the beginning too, but like keeping in mind that Cashin is writing to monks, right? Um, But all of this, again, as we've said a thousand times before on this podcast, the monks are supposed to be the reference point for all baptized Christians. And so... Um, all of this can be translated to the people in the world as well. So the first induces those who are poor to acquire and save the goods they lacked in the world. The second compels those who have renounced worldly goods by offering them to God to have regrets and to seek after them again. A third infects a monk from the start with lack of faith and ardor, so preventing his complete detachment from worldly things producing in him a fear of poverty and distrust in God's providence and leading him to break the promises he made when he renounced the world. I've done all of those. Um, ditto. <laughs> um, and probably all of our listeners can say they've done all of them as well. <laughs> um, so, 
uh, this is this is another really good part from this section. He says, um, he said they should know. However, he's talking again about the monks that they have not yet renounced the world or achieved monastic perfection. So long as they are ashamed to accept for Christ's sake the poverty of the apostle and to provide for themselves and the needy through the labor of their hands. Um, so, so this concept of like, like we need to be willing to work and to provide um, to the extent that, that we're able and that God has gifted us. You know, like after our episode on work, someone sent an email and they were like, I'm on disability and so I can't work. And so does that mean that I'm condemned? And I was like, it was heartbreaking to to see that because I, I could tell that they were like actually asking the question, right? Um, and I was like, no, like, <laughs> of course not. Um, we are, we're all called to work and to provide to different extents, depending on our physical capabilities. Like maybe for that person who's on disability, their work looks like, um, sending an email of encouragement to someone that they know uh, who is down or or maybe their work looks like um, praying more than those who um, are working a nine to five are able to do, like praying more intentionally or things like that. Um, so, um, so to avoid this greed, um, Cashin is making the point that we need to... Um, be be humble enough to accept the poverty of the apostle and to work to provide for ourselves and the needy. Um, like we're not just working for our own upbuilding or providing for ourselves, but for for the poor that the Lord has placed in our life. Um, yeah. Yeah. The. Um, want me to tell a quick story? Please, yeah, that's okay. fine. So I think the, we we don't we don't need to do any more evil thoughts. I think we can. Okay do another episode to cover the other ones. Nice. Amen. Because I won't need to do the historical context and stuff on the next one. Oh, amen. True. True, true. All right. Um, So one of the things that I I remember being a kid and, and, um, Lupe. Oh, Oh, this is terrible timing. I know. Um, You know what? Maybe for the next episode, I may go into the other office, which may be a little little bit further from most of the lawn where he's mowing. Okay. Um, Anyway, the, um, so I remember, we had we were in a, a neighborhood, kind of an average Albuquerque neighborhood, and and there was a, a, a like a two story house that a dentist had built in the neighborhood, like three blocks from us, and this it just so stood out from the other one story two bedroom houses that were in the neighborhood, and so um, one time my dad I think called it a monstrosity, just like in relation, like nobody would call it a monstrosity now, but it was like in relation to the house. So I remember hearing monstrosity, like loving that word as a little kid. Um, But I like, it's one of those things like we don't have a two story house. So when you have a house with your own stairs, like there's stairs literally in my house. Like that, that was a huge deal. Um, when I never had that as a kid, but my parents have it now, you know, it's have stairs and it's like, Oh my gosh, there there's, and my parents, thank God we're not, they weren't doing this. They weren't, getting a, stair, a home of stairs just because we never never had it when we were young. But I definitely now will will go will want to go to restaurants and will probably spend more money at a restaurant that, that I can sit by the window right by the street. Hmm. Because that was one of those things where the restaurants that I went to when I didn't, you know, when I wasn't in control of my own money and I was a college student thinking of this, it was all restaurants of like you know, fast food restaurants where you're, you're sitting in a booth by the wall or, or like an IHOP or, you know, um, Eaton Park in, uh, near Steubenville. But, but having a nice restaurant with a big window or like even better, like in LA, you could do this all year round, thank God. But having a, like you, you almost like sitting on a patio and everybody's walking right by you. Like that was definitely a, I will do, I will sit on the patio just because I remember being as a kid and thinking that's for rich people. Like mm. rich people sit there eating while you're walking by you know, with their nice wine glasses and things like that. And so, um, like I, I, I love that experience and, and I need to make sure after saying that, that's, that it's, that it's not avarice or greed. The second one, um, regret for those things given up. I, I went, when I went to Thomas Aquinas, I sold all my CDs. I sold all my Dave Matthews band collection, all my blues traveler. I sold like all my smashing pumpkins. Like I smelled sold all of my CDs and then 
over the course of the next seven years, I kind of bought most of them back again. <laughs> because I, I had that very real regret. I'm like, I, I sold them out of some like ultra piety of like, I don't need these old CDs anymore. I'm going to listen to classic music the rest of my life. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> oh. So anyway. Um, and then the, then the third one is just what, from the very beginning, um, fear. Oh, that's fear. I, I had the thought the other day, I've always thought, well, I'm not going to like, they're requesting, especially here in California, oh, you need to prepare for two weeks. You know, if, if an earthquake knocks out the power, you need to survive for two weeks. Or if there's a, a you know, if Russia drops an atomic bomb on middle of Los Angeles and somehow the Hollywood Hills stop it from hitting me, um, I like, I, how do I, how do I survive? I was like, I could, I could get two weeks worth of food and water for myself and they'd be gone in a day because I would just give it all away. Like, I, I hope I would. I would hope I would like, <clears throat> people would come and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not going to be any different than you. But I'm like, well, what if I, what if I'm needed for the sacraments? And so I actually have to like provide for myself just so I can give the sacraments. I'm like, stop, 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 stop. Mm-hmm. You're overthinking it. You're, you're making an excuse for the greed of, of not sharing what you have with others. And, and those excuses are ridiculous. There's something so childlike and move with the spirit. I love moving the spirit, move with the spirit, give it where you think it needs to be given and, you know, get on with your life and death and whatever it's going to be. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I I think I've talked about this before, but um, that's actually something that I deeply admired about uh, a simple house when I was there as a, a missionary is a simple house of Saints Francis and Alphonsus. I was a missionary there for a year and a half, um, and I was living in Kansas City. We mostly helped single mothers in the projects, but did some homeless ministry as well. But it was one of the very few organizations that I've ever heard of that had— we had voluntary poverty amongst the volunteers, but also voluntary corporate poverty. So um, I was the accountant while I was there. Um, that was part of my um, responsibilities. And we were required as an organization, um, we were not allowed to have more than, it was either two or three months, I don't remember, um, two or three months worth of bills in our bank account at any at any time. And so it was just like, radical dependence on divine providence. The only exception to this was like, if we were saving up for a new property or we were saving up for a car or something, we could have something set aside for that. But just general operations, we were not allowed to have extra money in our bank account. And so if donors were just particularly generous in a month, then we were just particularly generous with our ministry in that month. And um, that's something that that I really, really loved. Like, uh, And there, there were times because of it that, you know, um, we would get, $200 a month as a stipend as volunteers. And then um, I think $10 a week per volunteer for food. And um, so there were there were a couple times that like the bank account was just so low and we were all meeting um, and like, what are we going to do? And, um, you know, one of us would say like, you know what, I don't need my stipend this month. And someone else would say like, I think I can cut back on this this month and so on and so forth. And we would just like figure out the places that um, we were going to cut funds. And then we'd be having this long meeting and then someone would be like, all right, let's just like take a break. Um, I'm going to run to the post office, whatever, come back. There was a $5,000 check in the mail, you know, and it's just like, it just, the Lord provides and we just become so fearful and, and try to, to grasp and to fill those things ourselves and like, that's just like goes back to Adam and Eve, right? Like trying to grasp to to fulfill as mm-hmm. opposed to just receive as gift, um, and to trust that that we have a good Father who wants to provide for us. So, and I also think it's very important to say, like in any talk of tithing or things like this, when we sometimes that exactly happened. That happens so many times in my life, and happen, I've heard it in millions of other people's lives where they're struggling. They they act in faith, and somebody provides, but. Mm-hmm. Sometimes God doesn't provide. Some, I'm sorry. God always provides. Sometimes, uh, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> another I was person like heresy. Provide. Heresy. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes somebody doesn't provide, and that that again, this sounds like such a cop out, but it is so true. Sometimes having the experience of that struggle of the cross of the sacrifice that actually makes us stronger, more able to endure mm-hmm. anxiety and stress and worry and and even hunger. I mean, the things like this, you know these moments of Jesus is just like, I'm, I'm actually, you're going to, 
eat less food for a week. You're, you're going to be stressed for weeks. I want to teach you how not to worry. I want to teach you how, how even if even if someone doesn't give a big donation, I want you to have the experience that I'm still going to take care of you. I'm still going to let you minister. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to give you the strength, the power, the courage to do that well. And that's sometimes even a greater gift than someone giving the $5,000. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I think we should pause here, wrap up this episode, and then do another episode to cover the other five. How do you feel about that, Father Michael? Yeah, absolutely. I say that, and then it's probably going to end up being two more episodes, but we'll see. I'm going to try to get through five in the next episode. Um, so, okay. Um, so, all of the things, we are on Facebook and Instagram and um, Twitter is just Father Michael at Padre Michael O. Um, I'm going to s- just stop saying that one. Uh, email what God is not podcast at gmail.com. Website what God is not.com. And we have a Goodreads page. We have a Patreon um, if you want to support our nonprofit, um, which supports this podcast and also gives to the poor and tithes to our churches and other Christian ministries. Um, that's Fotina, P-H-O-T-I-N-A dot org. And um, we are on YouTube, audio only. If you're listening to us, particularly on Apple Podcasts, please uh, give us a nice, the stars, and say something nice about us in the review. Um, and don't say mean things, because Mother Natalia has a very sensitive heart. Um just put Father Michael colon and then say the main things. Yeah, that would be don't great. Don't read those on Smother. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Father Boniface. I need the humiliation. Father Boniface and I were talking about my sensitivity the other day. And he was like, I was like, Father Boniface, I'm so sensitive. And he was like, 12. You're a 12 on a scale of 1 to 10. <laughs> I was like, okay. I, I, um, I like that word earlier. So I like, what was, the, what was the context of, in the 80 Evil Thoughts, I think it was something about a delicate delicate sensibilities or delicate spirits like that oh it's delicacy yeah i was like sometimes a mother has a very delicate <laughs> <laughs> that's funny um it was a when we were talking about gluttony he was talking about age illness or delicacy of body <laughs> um okay i think those are all the things prayer intentions um do 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 this is a very exciting prayer intention um Docomos Olivia is being tonsured as a Rasafor nun. So um, that's happening on November 20th. I finally remembered to ask her permission to make her my prayer intention, which is the one that I was trying, that I almost said last time and then realized I couldn't say that without her permission. And um, so November 20th, she will receive the full habit and a new name, Sister Something. And... Father Michael's going to be here for that, which is why he's going to be in the Steubenville area in November. Um, so pray for Olivia. That's the whole That's the whole story. It's going to be live streamed. Um, so if any of you want to watch the tonsure, it's a Vesper service. It's much shorter than the life profession, I promise. Um, it's just a regular Vespers, great Vespers um, with... Um, the tonsure service in the midst of it. And it's only like the tonsure part is only like 20 or 30 minutes. So, um, yeah. So and if you want to watch that, that, um, um, probably on our website, Christ, the um, or our Christ or, or the bridegroom or the monastery's Facebook page, or I don't know, look around, but, um, I think we'll have posted something on our blog by the time this comes out. And so people will be able to, look at christthebridegroom.org again and there will be something on our blog about how you can watch it or something. So, Yeah. All right, my Which is what I was brewing the beer for. That's the point. Ah, for the tonsure. Yep. There it is. I was wondering. I, I was not. I forgot that you said that. But that Yeah, so did I. I was like, like there's something else around. that I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask for prayer intentions. I was just thinking first people popped in my mind. Um, please pray for... The people who really struggle with gluttony and lust and avarice. Name them, Father Michael. 
All right. So uh, first, <laughs> gluttony. <laughs> Just that would be awkward when I say who I'm praying for. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll, the, the first three people that came to mind was was Father Joel Barstadt and Leslie Barstadt. So Father Joel is my successor in Denver. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm, I'm so incredibly proud and, and I love watching cause it's really hard when you, when you get transferred and you love your people so much and it's, it's really been nice seeing their new adopted father in father Joel and, and just how happy I am, um, for him that he gets to experience the people I love so much for them that they get to experience someone I love so much in him and his leadership. Sorry, Los Angeles is happening behind me. Um, and uh, and then Leslie, of course, is his wonderful wife, who's been so good um, about everything and to me and, and working so hard. And then also pray for uh, Libby Reichert, who's out there right now with Mother Natalia, and she's mm-hmm. on the Pustinia. So I'm going to miss her this weekend because she's out uh, with you. But um, yeah, pray for Libby. And it's so great because um, Andrew Whaley was here on Pustinia a couple weeks ago, and That's then right. Maddie was here last weekend, and then Libby's here this weekend. Uh, I'm like, oh, all of my LA California folks. California Paris is taking over. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And then you'll be here cool. next month, not Pustinia Ying, but just for the tonsure. And although I hear you're going to ditch the tonsure to go to Chesterton's and smoke I'm cigars. About it. But. Only because you called it the full name. <laughs> now I'm mad. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Love you, Father Michael. Thank you. Listeners, love you, too. Love you. you guys are great. Um, All right. Father, can you give us a blessing? Will the blessing keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, have mercy on you. May our Lord give you gratitude for the ways that you have been working with him and responding well to his grace, the ways you've been growing in good habits and good virtues, the ways that you have been listening to the guidance of our Lord and the holy angels and growing in theosis. May you live a life of thanksgiving and gratitude. And may you also abhor sin and abhor the evil thoughts and Recover quickly and well when they enter into your mind and you carry out sin in all of its different forms. May our Lord, through the knowledge of these evil thoughts, give you hope and may you be able to uh, fight off through his power any attacks of the devil that bring despair and shame. May our Lord uh, give you a strength and heart to understand his will and watchfulness and a strength and heart to, to carry it out with great courage and perseverance. May Lord allow you to be patient with yourself in this process and allow you to understand his own guidance every step of the way. May Lord bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.